have a few sermons on some of the songs that we read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The first song, or uh, it may also be called a prayer, that we're going to look at is Hannah's song. Hannah's song of thanksgiving that we read about in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. So let's all turn there. The song's actually in chapter 2, but uh, this, the, uh, the story is introduced to us in, the, in chapter 1. So I'm going to start by reading chapter 1 of 1 Samuel to give us the context of who Hannah is and why she sings a song of praise and thanksgiving to God in chapter 2. And I'll read the whole chapter. So starting in verse 1. There was a man, a certain man, from Ramathan Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and that's Hannah of our story today, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man, her husband, would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, that she would provoke her, and so she wept and would not eat. Then Elkan Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting by the seat, on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. <coughs> now it came about, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have, neither, I have, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you may have that you have asked of him. <coughs> she said, Let your maidservant find favour in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time, after Hannah had conceived, that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Samuel uh, means the Lord has heard. I looked that up. Um, then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. 
For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. So I have dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. So here we read about the birth of the prophet Samuel, which is what obviously the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel are about. Samuel was the great prophet who gave guidance and revelation to the king Saul and, the king, and king David. And we see that he's also the last judge of Israel. Uh, we read about all the judges in the book of Judge, in, all the judges in the book of Judges after they left Egypt and moved into that land. And uh, it's all recorded there in the book of Judges. We have Eli. He is also, he's the second last judge, the penultimate judge. He is Samuel's predecessor. And Samuel is the last judge before we have the age of the kings start with King Saul. And Hannah, of course, is the mother of this prophet, Samuel. And she is, as we read, she is barren. Her, the Lord has closed her womb. Uh, her, her husband has two wives, however, the other wife has many children and there is bitterness and enmity between them because the, the woman with the, with the children mocks the one who doesn't have any. And eventually, of course, uh, Hannah, through her prayers, through her sacrifices, through her dedication to the Lord, uh, her prayers are answered and God finally gives her this son. But she has made a promise to the Lord, this son, if, if the Lord will give her a son. He will be dedicated to God. And that's what we read about in the latter half of this chapter, that Samuel was born to Hannah, but at a very young age, he was taken up to the temple of God and he was left there by Hannah, dedicated to, to the service of the Lord. Now, I'm going to read now with that brief introduction of, of the situation of, of Hannah and Samuel's birth. We're going to read chapter 2, or at least the first part of chapter 2, where we have a song that's given by Hannah. And I'm going to read it. It goes from verses 1 through to 11. So let's read that now. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, and she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honour. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he sets the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For, but, for not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. That is the song of Hannah that we're going to be studying this morning. Now, before we get into the details of this song, I've got a couple of notes to make. Do we think that this song is at all like the one that... Well, for a start, it says in verse 1, Then Hannah prayed and said... I call it a song. Is it a song or is it a prayer? It says in verse 1 that Hannah prayed. I don't think it's wrong to assume that this is a type of song. It's not uh, done in silence. Uh, it's something that she has re rejoiced and exalted the God, our, um, God in. And it brings to mind what we read about in James chapter 5, verse 13. If anyone is among you is suffering, then he is to pray. But if anyone is cheerful, he is to sing praises. I think this is a praise from Hannah. It's a song that she has sung to, the, to God. And I think it's very different to the prayer or song, if you want to call it that, that she gave in chapter 1. Where chapter 1, she is in sorrow and she is desperately pleading with, the, with God for a child. And it says that her lips were moving, but she was praying in her heart. 
That was a time of sorrow for Hannah, a time of pleading. This is now a time of celebration, a time of exaltation. But we also have to consider, was this perhaps not a time mingled with sorrow for Hannah? Because, of course, she, after all these years, have, has finally been granted a son. And now at a very young age, we're not told exactly how old, but probably maybe two or three years old, she is, the time has come to give this son across to the Lord. She has breastfed him through his, uh, the years as a baby, but he is now weaned and it is time to give him into the service of, the, into the service of God. Um, you would think that perhaps she might have some sort of bitterness or sorrow in her heart that she had to give up her son Samuel so soon after having received his gift from God. But we don't see any hint of that in this prayer, do we? We see nothing but faith and glory to God and thanksgiving. So this is clearly a woman of great faith. So with all that said, let's go through this song of Hannah's. Firstly, I want you to bear in mind that this is a song given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say that right at the start, but we'll see that as we pass through the song, that this is an inspired song. It's not just something that Hannah's made up in her joy and happiness, but rather it is divinely inspired. So, verse 1. My heart exalts in the Lord because I rejoice. Um, my, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Um, so here, there's no hint of the sorrow that Hannah would have felt at giving up her son Samuel to, to the Lord. Um, she, is, she is simply filled with this exaltation that her prayer has been fulfilled and after all that suffering, after all of that humiliation that she had to undergo by being this woman who had no children, and, that, and yet having to live with another woman who had so many children, that time is now over for her. Uh, that suffering, that persecution, that ridicule that she had to endure is, is no longer. And so she is filled with joy and exaltation. Verse 2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Now, we've already seen this. I mean, she's... We've already seen, for example, in the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. Hannah knows these commandments. She surely knows the law of Moses. She has studied the law. She's a woman of faith. But there is, it says there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. And I think what we're starting to see here at the beginning of this song is what you could say is an introduction to the overall book of Samuel. Because all the things that we see in this song are things that are prophesied to occur in this very book. Um, let's turn across a, a few um, pages to chapter 5 of this book. Hannah has just said, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Well, in chapter 5, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured by the Philistines and taken into one of their uh, idol temples. This idol whose name is Dagon. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, it says, The Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. What a, what a thing to wake up to in the morning to see your great idol, Dagon, twice, not just once, but twice, fallen before the Ark of the Covenant, and the second time, no less, being basically destroyed. So, when Hannah sings that song about there being no one besides God, how true that is proven to be. 
in, the, in what happens shortly in the future with this idol, Dagon, that he cannot, the, this idol, it's, it's, there's nothing there. It's a demon or it's nothing at all. It's a mute lump of wood or stone. It can't do anything. Of course, God is the one who will not tolerate that kind of, even though it's a false idol, he will not tolerate that kind of, uh, any sort of equality with himself. There is no one besides him. Um, and that's exactly what happens in this situation as what Hannah had sung about. Uh, verse 3 in Hannah's song, she continues, Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. How often do we see this theme played out in the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New? In James chapter 4, verse 6, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's also quoted in 1 Peter 5, 5. We've got the example of the rich, uh, the rich, rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who didn't care at all for God, the poor man by his gate, the dogs licking his wounds. But what happens in the end? We know that story very well, I'm sure. But of course, in this very book, we see this same theme taking place. Just in the next chapter, let's read the story now of Eli's sons. We saw them briefly mentioned in chapter 1, his two sons who were ministering in the temple of the Lord. His, their names were Hophni and Phinehas. So let's uh, go to chapter 2, verse 12 now. This is just after the song. And we'll see what happens to these two sons. And bear in mind the things that Hannah has just sung. What does she say? Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And most importantly, with him actions are weighed. So verse 12 tells us this about Eli's sons. The sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the custom of the priests with the people, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man he was sacrificing, give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, they must surely, surely burn the fat first, and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, no, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. So there we have two things that they would do. Um, it appears from the context that they were taking excessive amounts of meat from the sacrifices, and then they were also taking the fat also, which was supposed to have been burned prior to them taking it, but they would take it beforehand, and if the person objected, then they would simply take it by force. If we turn a little bit further down, uh, Eli hears about this, and in fact there's more to it than that. It's not just the, the way they were treating the sacrifices to God. In verse 22, uh, it says this, Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So there's another thing we find out about the two sons here. Not were they just taking from the sacrifices of God, but they were defiling the tabernacle of God by lying, sleeping with the women who served at that temple there, at the doorway. So we can see here that when it says Eli's sons were worthless men, this is truly the case. But Hannah has just sung that proud, pride and arrogance shall be weighed with God. And these men were certainly examples of pride and arrogance. The presumption and the arrogance to not just do these things in any normal circumstances, but to do them in the temp right before the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the, temp the sacrifice of God, in the tabernacle of God, to do these things is the, uh, the absolute height of arrogance and presumption. What happens to these two men? In verse 34, God sends a prophet to speak with Eli. We don't know who this prophet is, but uh, in verse 34, this man says to uh, Eli, this will be the sign to you. 
which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. That's the punishment that is dealt out to these two sons. On the same day, both of them will die. And we see that fulfilled in chapter 4, verse 11. There is a battle, uh, Israel is defeated, and both on that same day, those two sons are both slain. So God has weighed the actions of these two men, just as Hannah had prophesied about in her song. And certainly that's not the only example we could look at, but I think it's a great introduction to the book of, of Samuel, isn't it? That we have this song from Hannah, making all these sorts of prophecies about the actions of God, the way God acts, and we see it take place. It's like, it's like a contents page almost of the book of Samuel, what we're reading about in Hannah's song here. Verses 4 and 5 of, the, of her song. Let's turn back there now. Verse 4. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry cease to hunger. I think this is still quite closely linked to what we just read about in verse 3, about those who are proud and arrogant. But this time, it's slightly different. Instead of talking about pride and arrogance per se, it's talking about those who are mighty, those who are strong, and those who are wealthy, those who are full of bread. It's the same sort of thing. The f verse 3 is about the pride and the arrogance, verse 4 and 5 is about the strong in war who have the bows uh, and the, the swords, the, the, the weapons, or those who have the wealth and the power to influence things and to do things in this world. But Hannah is saying that those people will be judged by God as well. What does James say about that? In James chapter 5, he talks about those who are rich and those who put their trust and their reliance and riches. He says in verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the labourers who mowed your field and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man who does not resist you. That's the judgment of the rich, of the wealthy and the powerful. Not just, not just because they were rich or powerful, but because they put their trust and their reliance not in God, but in their riches. Those who put their reliance on the riches will end up in this situation. What about the mighty? What about the powerful, those who have these, the bows of the mighty? I think the best example that we can read about in the book of Samuel is, of course, David and Goliath in chapter 17. Goliath, wasn't he a man who put his trust in his armour, in his helmet, in his great sword, in his lance? He had, he assumed, of course, that no one could stand up to him. But what does Hannah say? The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Who was the feeble? David, the young shepherd boy at the time. He had nothing. He just had a sling and some rocks. And yet he took down Goliath. Just like Hannah said, the bows of the mighty are shattered, but the, the, the uh, feeble put on strength. The latter half of verse 5 says, Even the barren gives birth to seven, and she who has many children languishes. I think it's pretty obvious here what this is a reference to. This is a reference to Hannah's own personal situation with her uh, wife. Uh, her, I don't even know what the relationship there is. Her husband's other wife. Um, that wife, Phinehas, had many children. Hannah had only the one son or had at the time she had no sons she had she had nothing but now she says even the barren gives birth to seven but she who has many children languishes it's not told to us i think it's pretty clear this is talking about hannah and, um, and phinehas but it's not told to us exactly what happened to phinehas after this we never read about this woman ever again but from this passage i would suggest that perhaps things didn't go so well for phinehas perhaps 
it says that she who has many children languishes. Uh, perhaps um, this woman who had mocked and reviled Hannah, uh, perhaps something uh, bad happened to her at some point, which we don't know about. Hannah also says, however, that she, ha even those who are barren, uh, even the barren gives birth to seven. Now, so far, Hannah's only had one child, Samuel, and she had to give him away, didn't she? she does she have zero children now? Is she back down to nothing? God, of course, doesn't forget about her, his great servant, Hannah. A woman of great faith like this, she's not going to be left abandoned by God. Let's read uh, a bit further down in this chapter to what happens to Hannah afterwards. In chapter 2, verse 18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen, a linen ephod, and his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So, is that a small comfort that at the very least... Hannah would see her son Samuel once a year when she would come up to offer the yearly sacrifices at the tabernacle. She would bring up a new little robe for her growing son uh, and that would be a great time of reunion for Hannah and Samuel on, those, on that one, every occasion every year. That's not really that much, is it? To only see your one son once a year is still quite a sad thing. But Hannah is still yet to be blessed further. Um, in verse 21, it says, The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. So, Hannah's not left childless, even though she gave up her son Samuel. She fulfilled her promise to God. Her promise was, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to the Lord. And she did that. She weaned him, and then she dedicated him to the Lord. But God does not forget that. She still wanted to have her children. She didn't want to have that reproach upon her of being a barren woman. You could also say in verse 3 where it says, with him actions are weighed. Certainly Hannah's actions were also weighed. Eli's son's actions were weighed in one sense and they received judgment. Hannah's actions of faith and trust in God were weighed and she received blessing and reward. In verse 6 it says, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. Now, I think there's a, there's a few ways you could read this passage. Of course, we know, as we already read about, that God brings down the wicked and the, the arrogant and he raises up the poor and the humble and the righteous. In that way, Goliath was killed by God. Eli's sons were killed. And yet, life was given to Hannah's womb and to the children that she bore. And this is, of course, a recurring theme throughout the whole Bible, not just here in, in the book of Samuel. Um, we have the wicked king Saul. Saul started from a lowly position and God raised him up. And, but when he turned, into, uh, turned to evil ways, God removed him and eventually he died as punishment. And the same way, David himself was raised up from a lowly circumstance and uh, made king over all of Israel. But I think there may be another way you could read this, and we'll see it later on in this very song. But of course we have the example of Jesus. Jesus who was brought down to Sheol and who was raised up again. We know from Acts that that's where he went. He went to Hades when he died on the cross. But of course, he only stayed there for a couple of, not, not even two days really. He stayed there for a short period of time and was raised up again. So this is possibly a prophecy of the Messiah here. I would, I, I would sit on the fence about it, but certainly later on in this, um, in this song, we do see a prophecy about the Messiah. Um, in verse 7, it says, the Lord makes rich, sorry, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honour. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he sets the world on them. 
I think the latter half of this passage, of, of, of this section here, is important to understand the former. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. God made all these things, and everything belongs to him. So, when it says he makes poor and he makes the rich, he does this as he sees fit. He doesn't just take poor people and make them rich, or rich people make them poor. Those who are rich or poor are made that way by God. Who are we, perhaps, in the church services to favor, uh, give, have favorites in the church because of people's wealth or status? And that's going back to James again, that's exactly what he cautions against in chapter 2. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Verse 2, For if a man comes to enter your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit by my footstool. Have you not become... Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? That's exactly why James says that. Because looking at what 1 Samuel chapter 2 says, God makes rich and he makes poor. And not just that, but the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he set the world on them. He made all these things. If someone is rich, it is through God's blessings. If someone is poor, it is because of God's decision. Um, that's just... It is all owned by God. It is all controlled by God. And there is no um, power within ourselves to change what God's judgment is on something. But he certainly does exalt the poor and take the wealthy and the powerful and put them into the dust, return them to the dust. Um, I mentioned before about Saul and David coming from humble circumstances. Let's turn and look at that. In our first Samuel chapter nine, we see what Hannah's song is prophesying about is fulfilled in both these kings. In first Samuel chapter nine, verse twenty-one, it tells us about Saul. At this time, Saul was still a good and righteous man. He was humble and he was willing to serve God, although that changed. In verse twenty-one, it says, "Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel?'" And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, why then do you speak to me in this way? This is when Samuel is approaching him to become king. Saul is humble and he recognizes that he is not only just from the smallest tribe, the, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, but he's from the least of the families within that tribe. But God exalts him and raises him from the dust to become king over all Israel. But then if we turn a few chapters on to verse 15, so only five or six chapters later, Saul's heart has changed. He's been king now for some time. His heart has changed. And of course, he disobeys, starts to disobey the commandments of God. And eventually, he is punished for his wickedness. And in 1 Samuel 15, verse 26, Samuel says to Paul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So God brings low and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and he returns them back to the dust again. The same situation is with David. If we turn the page to chapter 16, we all know David's story, where he came from, but let's read it again. In verse 10, uh, so Saul has approached Jesse, the father, the, um, David's father, and uh, saying that this is the king's the king is one of your sons where is he and in verse 10 so thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel but Samuel said to Jesse the Lord has not chosen these and Samuel said to Jesse are these all the children and he said there remains yet the youngest and behold he is tending the sheep and then Samuel said to Jesse send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes so he sent and brought him in and now he was ruddy with the beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So there we have it, that David himself was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven sons, well, eight sons actually, he was the eighth, the youngest of the lot, tending the sheep. And yet this was the one that God had chosen to raise up out of the dust, exalt him as, a, as king over all Israel. There's also the example of, uh, you remember the story of Nabal and Abigail? 
Nabal was that rich man, wasn't he? But he was a rich and foolish man. We read about in chapter 25. After he had uh, shunned David, not refused to help David out, even though David was a righteous and good man, David was a wealthy, uh, so Nabal was a wealthy but foolish man. He suffered his own punishment. In verse 38 of chapter 25, about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. And that was for his own wickedness. So Hannah's song there is certainly again fulfilled in that, well, it says in verse 8, in verse 7, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. These are all things that we read about in the book of Samuel. In verse 9, Hannah says, He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. I think we just, we've already covered this, haven't we? Look at all the examples of, of Samuel and how God, that we read about in the book of Samuel, and how God looked after his righteous people and how he punished the wicked. We've got David. How many times was he protected by God from the hand of Saul? What about Abigail? She was the wife of, of, of Nabal, but she was a righteous woman. But God looked out for her interests and she ended up becoming the wife of King David. Jonathan, he was also protected many times. Although event, he was a righteous man, he did die, of course, eventually. But that was God's decision. And then there's the wicked ones, all the wicked people who conspired against the righteous people in this book. Goliath, he made a, a sad, a bad end. Saul made a bad end. Nabal. Where Absalom, King, King David's son, he was a wicked man. They all met bad ends because they were wicked. As it says, the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. But he keeps the feet of his godly ones. And finally, at the end of the song, it says this. And I'm starting from the, the end of verse 9 here because I think that the verse should have actually been split. Uh, verse 10 should have started. For not by might shall a man prevail. Th those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. That makes far more sense to start verse 10 there. For not by might. Uh, for not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. For he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. When it says that not by might shall a man prevail. Prevail against what is the question? What will you not prevail against? And the answer is clearly the Lord. All things are the Lord's. A man will not prevail against the Lord if the Lord has made a judgment upon someone. If a man speaks in arrogance and wickedness, as we read about in verse 3, then the Lord will weigh him and he will be brought low. He will be brought back into the dust. No matter how mighty he is, the bows of the mighty are shattered. If that's the Lord's decree, then that is what will happen. If a man is full of wealth, but he speaks out against the Lord, then as it says, those who are full hire themselves out for bread. A man who was wealthy, who had a full stomach, now has to go and hire out his services just so that he can eat. That will be the Lord's decree upon such a person. And there is nothing that a man can do. His might will not prevail against, the God, against God. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Consider the many examples of those nations that invaded Israel that we read about in the book of, of, of 1 Samuel and Kings. They were all defeated. What about the, the, the classic example of the Assyrians? They took away the northern kingdom into exile, but when they tried to approached the city of Jerusalem, they surrounded it. But Hezekiah, the righteous king, prayed for deliverance and the angel of the Lord slew 185,000 Assyrians in that one night. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. And we see that fulfilled in the example of the Assyrians. But interestingly, in verse 10, it starts talking about a king. We have to remember when this was written, there was no kingdom yet. Saul had not been established as a king. They were still under the judges. Eli was judge when this was sung. There was no kingdom. There was not even a thought of a kingdom. So why is Hannah singing about a kingdom? 
And that's why we have clear evidence that this is in fact an inspired song. And it's also a prophecy. But it's not just a prophecy about the coming physical kingdom of Israel, is it? Certainly, Saul and David and Solomon were yet to come. But it says that the Lord, in verse, it says in verse 10, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Ends of the earth is, is not just a, a kingdom over the kingdom of his people, of the Jews in Israel. It's talking now about the Gentile nations. These nations, to the ends of the earth, will fall under the judgment of this king. So it's clearly a reference to the Messiah, although it's interesting to note that at least my New American Standard Bible uh, does not capitalize king. It will give strength to his king. The K is not capitalized there, though I think it is clearly a reference to the Messiah. But in the Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, it says, I will surely um, tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. We all know that's a clearly a reference to the Messiah. It says in verse 8, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, it says, speaking of Jesus, uh, it says, She gave birth to a son. It's talking about Mary or, the, or the, 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 nation, the tribes of Israel. They gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with an iron rod. There we have the king who is ruling, the iron nation, uh, ruling all the nations with a rod of iron. And uh, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So when it says in verse 10 here, the Lord uh, will give strength to his king, uh, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king, it's talking about the Messiah ruling with that rod of iron over the nations. And then finally it says, he will exalt the horn of his anointed. Jesus the Messiah is promised to be exalted. Certainly he died on the cross for our sins, but he will be exalted again. And it says the horn of his anointed. We, we, we've come across the, the usage of the word horn many times in our studies. We know what horn means. It refers to the kingdoms or, or strength or kings themselves. I think that what we have here, the horn of his anointed, is not just a reference to the Messiah, but it's a reference to the body of the Messiah, the church itself as well. We see that in other passages that... Jesus the Messiah is promised to be exalted, but we, as the body of Christ, are also to be exalted alongside him because we are part of the Messiah. We are his body. So, I've just taken us through now this song of Hannah. We've seen the many prophecies that are contained within it. Certainly at the end there, we see a clear prophecy of the coming Messiah, although it was still so far away yet from the time of Hannah. But all the things that we see about the power and majesty of God, that his, his righteousness, that he will punish the wicked, that he will reward the righteous, that he controls the things of this world, that he makes rich and he makes poor as he sees fit. These are things that we all see fulfilled in the book of Samuel. Now, when I speak again next, next month, we're going to be looking at another song, the song of David. But this is before he dies. This is David's uh, last song, and that's at the other end of the book of Samuel, at the end. This is the beginning, you could say the introduction to the book of Samuel. All these things that, we, that are about to take place in the book. The stories of David, of Goliath, of Nabat, uh, Nabal and Abigail, all these things are uh, fulfilled. When we come to it again, we're going to look at it from the perspective of, of David now, at the end of his life, at the end of, uh, of the books of Samuel. So, um, as I mentioned before, we have the prophecy, prophecy here of the Messiah coming. That was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. That promise was fulfilled. That was, we see time and time again in the Old Testament was fulfilled. And of course, in, in Acts, after he had died and risen again and been taken back up to heaven, Peter gave that sermon 
in Jerusalem, the first ever recorded sermon, the first one that ever took place. And he said, to become part of this Messiah, to become part of the body that is exalted with him, you have to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's what we've all done here today. And if anyone's listening to this sermon here this morning, who has not been baptized, then Jesus is that one who was exalted, as was prophesied about. And the only way to become part of that body of Jesus is as has been set forth for us in his gospel, in his New Testament. And it says there to believe and repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So thank you for your time this morning. That concludes uh, my